standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. If you have any questions, please direct them to the Q&A feature on the toolbar. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Ben Beard. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar today that's sponsored by the HHS Working Group on Lyme and Other Tick-Borne Diseases. My name is uh, Dr. Ben Beard. I'm Chief of the Bacterial Diseases Branch in CDC's Division of Vector-Borne Diseases. Today's webinar will focus on the state of the science in our understanding of Borrelia persistence in animal models and in humans. And um, I'd like to emphasize that the views expressed in this webinar today as you can see in this slide, uh, are those of the participants and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Department of Health and Human Services or the U.S. government. As an introduction to the topic, most of you will know that uh, Lyme disease is caused by the spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi here in the United States. It's harbored in small mammals and is transmitted by ticks that are on deer. Currently, there are over 30,000 cases that are reported uh, to, to us at CDC. That was in 2012. And um, published studies, as well as recent CDC estimates, suggest that this number is likely a tenfold underestimate of the actual numbers of diagnosed cases per year. Lyme disease is the seventh most common reportable disease here in the U.S., and cases have been increasing steadily, both in numbers and in distribution. The symptoms of Lyme disease range from an erythema migraines rash as seen early in the course of infection to neuritis, carditis, and arthritis in later disseminated stages of, of illness. Prompt treatment with two to four weeks of oral doxycycline results in symptomatic cure of the great majority of these patients. A subset of patients, however, especially those who are diagnosed and treated in later stages of illness, may have persistent fatigue, muscle aches, short-term memory problems, and other nonspecific symptoms. One of the highest priority research needs in the field of Lyme disease is to elucidate the specific cause or causes of symptoms in these patients and to determine the safest and most effective treatment options. And now I'm going to turn over uh, the webinar to Dr. Joseph Breen. Uh, Joe is my colleague at NIH. So, Joe? Thank you, Ben. Um, what I'd like to review here is briefly talk about the objectives of the webinar. Uh, my name is Joe Breen. I'm the program officer for Lyme disease at the NIH in the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So basically, I manage all of the grants uh, funded by uh, our institute in, for Lyme disease, which is really the majority of, of Lyme disease grants funded throughout NIH. Our objectives uh, for the webinar are really to discuss the state of the science of persistence of infection by Borrelia burgdorferi. And what we hope is this leads to a better understanding of the topic and lead, therefore, to improve diagnostics safer and more durable therapeutics and improved prevention options, which are really the mission of NAID and also how Ben and I work together to achieve those goals through the HHS uh, working group along with other partners as well. Ben, can you advance, please? So here's uh, the speakers and the topics that we're going to discuss today. Um, we're going to be led by Stephen Bartold, who's going to talk about uh, comparative biology of Borrelia burgdorferi persistence, in a, primarily in a mouse model system. And then the, Linda Bakkenstedt, um, Dr. Linda Bakkenstedt from Yale, is going to talk about animal studies to assess Borrelia burgdorferi persistence, also uh, primarily in a mouse uh, animal model system. And then Dr. Monica Embers from Tulane is going to lead us into studies done in non-human primates studying, again, persistence of Borrelia burgdorferi. And, and then we'll have Dr. Adriana Marquez, uh, also from NIID, NIH, talking about some very recent studies for searching for persistence of infection in Lyme disease. And each speaker will have uh, 10 minutes to present, and we'll have uh, five minutes for questions. I'll go over that in the next slide. And then we have some time scheduled at the end for uh, a little bit of a roundtable or questions that can be entered uh, by the presenters or, or the audience, the people listening today. Uh, Dr. Lyndon Hugh has a presentation that will really talk about Borrelia burgdorferi persistence, the science, the consensus, what do we know, and the controversy. And really, where do we go from here? What kind of things do we want to 
continue to look at experimentally to try and better understand uh, persistence in Borrelia burgdorferi, which is really why we're all participating and here today. Can you go to the next slide, Ben? So questions can be, can be submitted online through the webinar interface. So that would be using the Q&A feature on the toolbar. Uh, and if you can, please uh, identify yourself and particularly who's the speaker that you're addressing so we can try and direct them to the person with the appropriate expertise. Uh, next slide, please. And this will be archived, so this is available in the future if you need more information or would like more information about Lyme disease. There's a website from the CDC uh, and also from the NIID where you can find uh, more information. And these presentations will be archived here once they're available. It does take a little bit of time to transcribe, um, but the, they will be available. Um, and you can check these websites to look for that update. At this point, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Bartold from uh, University of California, Davis, who's going to talk to us about um, comparative biology of Borrelia burgdorferi persistence. Dr. Bartold? Well, thank you, Joe. Um, just as a disclaimer, I'm a veterinarian, not a physician, so I see the world in a slightly different perspective. But 80% of human infectious diseases are of animal origin, and Borrelia is among those uh, zoonotic diseases, as they're said, as I said. So, uh, second slide. Um, I want to start my, my presentation with a couple of fundamental um, issues uh, or, or features of Borrelia infection. And that is, if life cycle in, in the wild is, is rather complex, requires multiple stages of ticks and multiple reservoir hosts and deer and so on, and it's very inefficient, and it, it would not work if reservoir hosts were not persistently infected. And furthermore, persistent infection needs not to harm the host, so that the primary host, as we see here in this image, is Paramiscus leucopus in the east and midwest. And these animals are not clinically affected by infection, and they're persistently infected basically for life. And this is an essential component of the evolved biology of, of Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, next slide. So if we look in the, in the skin, and this is a histologic section of skin, and you can see the little brown squiggly lines are Borrelia burgdorferi. And Borrelia does not live intracellularly, does not form biofilms in vivo. A lot of speculation has, has gone forward in terms of how does Borrelia persist and evade host immunity. It's actually extracellular, and it likes collagenous connective tissue. And here we see in the skin, it's right there at the interface where a tick is going to come along and, and pick it up. The remarkable thing is during persistent infection, that is, weeks or months into the infection of whatever host it may be infecting, there's virtually no inflammatory change in response to its presence. And that's an important feature as well. As I said, it's evolved not to harm its host, and it has very complex mechanisms by which it evades host immune clearance. Next slide. So all of this has been confirmed in, in laboratory animal models. And here we see paramiscus in the, in the left middle panel. Uh, there are laboratory paramiscus that, in which we've confirmed persistent infection, but also in, in laboratory mice, rats, hamsters, guinea pigs, gerbils, and two species of non-human primates. This is a universal behavior. Persistent infection lasts for many months, if not the entire life of these various hosts. Next slide. So the question and the purpose of this webinar is uh, persistent in humans, of course, and without treatment, it's certainly been well confirmed that, indeed, persistent infection can occur in, in humans. And the uh, question of the day is, following antibiotic treatment, it does persistent take place. Next slide. So a couple of concepts here when we get back to persistence is that it's probably unrealistic to expect that antimicrobial therapy, per se, will eliminate every single or microorganism from the infected host. And the role of antimicrobial therapy in vivo can be thought of as in terms of tipping the balance in favor of the host's own defenses against a particular pathogen. And these are universal concepts of antimicrobial therapy towards bacteria. However, 
The normal biology of Borrelia burgdorferi is immune evasion and persistence. And so the question at hand is, can antimicrobial therapy be expected to, complete, to be completely effective or eliminate all organisms? Next slide. So I'm not going to delve into specific studies, but rather uh, take the 30,000-foot uh, view of, of studies that have taken place in various labs throughout the United States and Europe using different animal models, the mouse, the dog, and, and the rhesus macaque, which Dr. Embrys will be talking about, with a variety of different classes of antimicrobial agents, doxycycline, amoxicillin, azithromycin, ceftriaxone, and tigacycline. And in all of these labs, uh, in all of these studies, there are common themes or comparative uh, results that, that come forward, and that is Borrelia burgdorferi DNA can continue to be de detected in tissues of these animals months after uh, completion of antibiotic treatment. In an almost recent study, literally 12 months after antibiotic treatment has been completed. Also, a consistent finding is that these animals and the tissues from these animals uh, are consistently culture negative. So we have Borrelia DNA, but we can't culture the spirochetes out of the, the tissues. Next slide. So the question before us then is, does this mean that there are viable spirochetes uh, surviving after antibiotic tissue or is this or treatment, or is it simply DNA debris that's persisting in these hosts? And again, looking at these various collective findings, we can see a spirochete in the connective tissue of a ligament or tendon of a, a mouse following treatment of, uh, with antibiotic. We can also use xenodiagnosis, that is, feeding ticks upon these treated animals, and the ticks acquire the DNA. And we can see spirochetes within these xenodiagnostic ticks by immunofluorescent antibody detection. We can also transmit the DNA from treated animals by tissue transplants, if we take tissues that are PCR DNA positive, we can transplant those tissues into naive skin mice and cause transfer of the DNA, but also dissemination of the DNA to key target organs. And we can also transmit the xenodiagnostic ticks back into naive hosts. And recently, we can also uh, demonstrate uh, with more sensitive uh, techniques, RNA transcription of multiple Borrelia burgdorferi genes, which suggests that these organisms are transcribing RNA and are functionally viable in some way. And again, the most recent study has shown actual resurgence of DNA levels in these animals at 12 months following completion of antibiotics to levels uh, equivalent to untreated infected animals at the same age and environmental conditions. Next slide. So we get back to key questions, and these studies, these animal studies show no evidence of recrudescence, which I just said actually does happen, or persistence of clinical and histologic findings of an active inflammatory response consistent with Borrelia, and therefore even if a few residual B. burgdorferi spirochetes or their DNA debris persist after antibiotic treatment in animal systems, they no longer appear to be capable of causing disease. We go back to that basic principle that I say, during persistent infection, whether or not the animals have been treated with antibiotics, we see no inflammation or disease. So, next slide. The question arises is, are the hosts responding to the presence of these uh, non-cultivable, uh, apparently viable spirochetes? And our most recent study has looked at various cytokines. Cytokines are chemicals that the body uses to uh, transfer information from one immune cell to another. And what we see in comparison to uninfected uh, age-matched animals is that the relative uh, RNA transcription of multiple cytokines is taking place. Uh, is this specific to live Borrelia burgdorferi or the presence of antigen or DNA? Uh, who knows? But certainly there's a pro-inflammatory cytokine talk going on in these persistently infected animals. Question is, do these relate to the human condition? And we have no way 
of directly answering that with animal model systems. But these animal models are very useful in testing specific hypotheses, treatment regimens, and so on. And so um, they've, they've been very useful in understanding the comparative biology of this organism. And from those studies, I think we can extrapolate uh, at least some information to the human condition. Next slide. And so I've, put, uh, or I've listed the specific references that I've been referring to, and you can read them at your leisure and looking them up in the, on, the, on the web. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bartold. Um, at this point, I'd like to um, address some of the questions. Um, I'll start out with one. Um, how does uh, Borrelia burgdorferi evade immune clearance during persistent infection? Um, this is a million-dollar question. I, I think the scientific community has picked away at this a little bit and, and found some mechanisms by immune modulation and, and or antigenic modulation and complement uh, systems and so on. But we really do not fully understand how Borrelia can persist. And I think the persistent phase of the infection is the last great frontier of, of area that we really need to understand the biology of that. And, and we have very little um, information on that. Um, another question that came in with, is with regards to um, your, how do your findings relate to possible well, the findings of uh, Borrelia, Bur Borrelia burgdorferi, but also uh, potentially Borrelia miyamotoi um, in the eastern U.S. The question is too long to read, but basically they're asking about how your results may compare between those two Borrelia species, or, or do they? I, I, cannot, I cannot answer that. I assume a miyamotoi is, is also a persistent infection. Um, its, its biology is no doubt similar, but it's, it's, uh, I, I don't know that much about that organism. Okay. Um, another question. Do studies in animals show, that show persistence after antibiotic treatment lend credence to a long-term antibiotic therapy? Uh, this is speculation because we really haven't tested that, um, but animal model systems allow us to test those questions. Um, but I would suspect that long-term antibiotics would simply keep the organisms in, in a sequestered mode. Um, but our most recent study in which we see resurgence of spirochetes out at 12 months suggests that maybe an alternate approach would be uh, intermittent treatment with short courses of antibiotics, um, and, and this would be based on clinical symptomology and other things. Um, again, that can be tested quite accurately in these animal models. Um, another question from a, a listener is, how do, is, can you explain the immuno, the immune reactive debris, such as the DNA that you mentioned, and how that might correlate with the myriad, myriad, myriad of neurological symptoms that can occur in people? Oh, boy, that's a million dollar question. I, I don't, I can, there's, there's no direct way we can detect that, but you know, the, the inflammatory state, whether it be prostaglandins or cytokines or, or whatever during the course of infection, uh, leads to fever, aches, pains, lots of nonspecific uh, symptoms in, in humans, which we can't measure in animals. Um, so it's only speculation on, on my part, but, but perhaps uh, those are the mechanisms by which neurologic signs or symptoms may be occurring in humans. But also the deficiency of animal models is that we don't get uh, neurologic infection in, in rodent models. Um, and that's because Borrelia likes connective tissue, and rodents don't have much connective tissue in their brain, whereas people have lots in their meninges and perivascular spaces and so on. And so we see that, we see that neurologic disease in larger animals like horses. Um, and it's, it's likely to be related to the direct presence of Borrelia and the inflammatory response that they're uh, inducing. Great. And I think one last question um, one of the listeners asked about um, how do you know that there weren't other reasons that cytokines were raised or lowered? Or were there, could there be other infections, for example, that would be responsible for that in your results? 
Well, uh, you know, that's certainly a good question, and, and uh, I think it's always wise to um, look at, at such results very critically. Um, but what we did in that study is we maintained the animals in a pathogen-free environment. Um, we monitored for mouse infectious diseases, particularly viruses, over the course of that experiment. And the control animals, the uninfected normal controls, were maintained side by side at the same time, same age, same environment. And so we're comparing cytokine levels between the post-treatment infected animals and uninfected animals. And that's the best we can do in scientific designs um, is try to control those variables. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barthold. At this point, I'd like to move uh, to our next speaker. And I might uh, remind uh, Dr. Barthold, so we may have time at the end to address uh, more questions. Um, okay. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Linda Bakkenstedt from the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Bakkenstedt? Thank you, uh, Joe. Um, I'll go to the next slide, I guess. Uh, the, um, oh, I'm having a little tr trouble here, but um, I just want to say that the reason we're here today and remind people is that um, because we're trying to set, understand the persistence of symptoms uh, that can be disabling after some people are treated for uh, Lyme disease. And we don't really know why that occurs, but several possibilities exist. And there really is uh, a lot of evidence supporting uh, various aspects of each of the theories that are listed on this particular slide. Uh, the one, though, I think that is of most concern is whether these symptoms are due to persistence of spirochetes that can multiply and cause recurrent disease. So when we examine the animal studies that evaluate um, persistent infection after antibiotics, there are many factors that are inherent in the experimental design that can influence the outcome. And some of these are listed here on the slide. Uh, for example, the Borrelia strain, because we know that some are more infectious than others, and some actually won't even infect certain hosts, such as a, 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 a dog, and will infect preferentially other hosts. Uh, the way the infection is introduced into the animal is important, whether it mimics the way people might acquire infection, for example, by a single tick bite. Um, the mammalian species that's being studied and whether it has a normal immune system, uh, whether that has been genetically modified or whether it's been, uh, uh, the immune system has been suppressed by drugs. Um, the choice of antibiotics is important and whether the dosing of the drug is optimized to kill the bacteria. And finally, the methods for use that we use to detect persistence of the organism. Of course, for most bacterial infections, the gold standard is culture. But uh, in the case of Borrelia, where we know that even with persistent infection, it's difficult to, in humans to culture the organism. In animal models, we can sample much larger areas, so it's easier. Uh, there are other methods that we can use as surrogates, and those are oftentimes the PCR-based methods, microscopy, um, looking at immune responses. But once you see those um, items, those traces or footprints of the Borrelia, you have to then determine whether that actually represents a live organism that can reproduce what Borrelia do, which are replicate, infect other hosts, and actually cause uh, disease. So um, over a decade ago, we tried to address this issue of persistence in a study in mice in which we infected them using tips. These were laboratory-reared ticks. Um, we put five ticks per mouse. And then we used the feeding of uninfected ticks. This is something called xenodiagnosis to assess whether the spirochete, spirochetes could be present after antibiotics. And I have to tell you that after significant searching, this is like a needle in a haystack, we found rare spirochetes and ticks um, that fed on some of the antibiotic-treated mice for a short period, up to three months after antibiotic treatment, but not thereafter. And we even tried suppressing the animal's immune system to see if we could make these spirochetes expand in numbers. Um, at the end of the experiment, though, we couldn't culture Borrelia from any of the antibiotic-treated mice, but we did detect trace amounts of DNA in some of the tissues. Now, as, as Dr. Barthold mentions, antibiotics are not necessarily meant to kill every last bacteria. They kill the majority, and the immune system mops up the rest, presumably. Um, or if the immune system cares enough that they're there, um, I think that's an important point to make. We considered that what we detected were in, uh, basically attenuated spirochetes that were the residua of infection and would eventually die or be eliminated by the immune system. 
So um, to try to develop a system in which we could get more of these attenuated forms to study, we turn to a mouse that has a deficient immune system that allows Borrelia to achieve much higher numbers in the tissues, more than 100 times that of what you would see in a normal mouse that's been infected. And using those mice, we found that uh, with antibiotic treatment, only one of the antibiotic treatment uh, treated mice was clearly infected, and this was determined by culture and a, a, a multitude of other methods. Um, we could only detect DNA in the tissues of the other, the rest of the antibiotic treated mice, but not mice, but not in the ticks that we use for xenodiagnosis. So at the same time we were doing that study, we studied normal mice on the same mouse background and found only trace DNA in a single antibiotic treated mouse. And so now those results differed from what we had published in our 2002 study. And when we looked at the differences in the study, there were a couple things. One is it had to do with the, the pharmacokinetics of the antibiotics we had administered. But uh, the second reason was that we were using a completely different mouse background. This is a B6 mouse, which is more resistant to uh, infection than a, uh, and disease than a C3H mouse, which we had used in our previous study. So we went back and used C3H mice uh, that we introduced this genetic mutation on uh, and uh, that caused the immune deficiency and got basically the same results that we got with the B6 mouse background. Our imaging techniques had been uh, improved during that time. We actually were able to do live imaging so that we could look at live anesthetized mice in the tissues and see spirochetes moving around. In the uh, antibody treated mice after, uh, after infection, after treatment, we could not find any more moving spirochetes, but we did find abundant remnants uh, of the spirochetes near cartilage, which you can see there in green, um, the remnants uh, in the picture there, uh, which were uh, contained DNA, but we couldn't detect live Borrelia in, uh, by uh, various methods. So, um, Dr. Ellen Barber wrote an editorial describing um, in the same issue that we published this paper, issue of the JCI that we published this paper, describing that what we were detecting after antibiotics was, was likely the remains of infection. In other words, the antibiotics had crippled the bacteria to the point where they could no longer replicate, and they may be breaking up into remnants that contain DNA, DNA and protein, that eventually uh, must be cleared by the uh, immune system, and that may take some time. So um, Dr. Barthold mentioned that infection can reappear in mice if one waits a long time. And so um, I'm showing you here in this slide some unpublished work of ours, which we conducted for different reasons in both C3H and uh, the immunodeficient C3H mouse strain to see whether duration of infection prior to treatment affects the outcome. And we followed these mice for quite a long time afterwards. The answer to our particular experimental question here, does an, uh, duration of antibiotic, uh, uh, duration of infection prior to antibiotics make a difference, was, uh, was no in this study. Uh, and in particular, I want to point out that uh, in the C3H mice that um, uh, had the immune deficiency, those remnants of the spirochete that we had seen earlier had become less abundant and in some mice undetectable by nine months after completion of the antibiotic therapy. Uh, importantly, though, in this study, the normal C3H mice were examined more than a year after treatment. And at that late time point, no detectable DNA could be found in the tissues. And we could not uh, uh, introduce uh, in infection into new mice by tissue transplant. So on the surface, these results seem to contradict those that what uh, Dr. Barthold has published and recently uh, told you about. But um, disparate results challenges us to think about other possibilities we might not have considered previously uh, in our experimental design. And uh, in looking at the animal studies that have been conducted look, uh, looking for Borrelia persistence after antibiotics, the majority have introduced infection using cultured spirochetes. And we know that bacteria grown in culture, and this is common to all bacteria that have been studied, um, are essentially a mixed population in terms of growth characteristics. And in the case of Borrelia in particular, when they're grown in culture, they may also be genetically different because Borrelia has a hard time maintaining complete genetic material during replication. 
Um, and then these slower growing bacteria may be more resistant to antibiotic treatment. It's not they don't have a drug a true drug resistance, but they may not be as sensitive to the effects of the antibiotics. So when you start growing these bacteria in culture, and particularly when the culture becomes more dense, these persister types, as some people call them, can become a significant proportion of the population. So I believe that the simple explanation uh, uh, for the uh, differences in the studies that I've conducted and those that Dr. Bartholds had conducted most recently is that the spirochetes we use to introduce infection in these animals, and we both use cultured spirochetes, and treated the mice with the same antibiotics, I have to uh, add, uh, was that mine were probably more on the phase of the earlier growth, and, uh, growth phase and had uh, fewer of these persisters than those that Bartold used in his study. But I think the real question we're asking here is whether persisters arise with pig transmission. And although we know that spirochetes uh, start multiplying greatly when ticks start to feed on a, on a host, uh, in fact, their numbers increase exponentially. Only a very few can make it through their through the, the tick immune system to, to the salivary glands and enter um, the skin at the tick bite site. And tick saliva helps those few spirochetes survive. So um, if I were to consider how to best design animal studies to gain insight into human disease, I think we have to carefully consider the question we, we're asking if it's whether antibiotics eliminate live spirochetes that can cause recrudescent infection when antibiotics are stopped, then we need to introduce infection in a way that most closely resembles the way people acquire Lyme disease through the bite, really, of a single infected tick that's been infected the way ticks become infected in nature. That's a larvae feeding on an infected mouse and allowing the larvae to molt to the nymph, and then the nymph uh, can infect your experimental mouse or, or animal. Uh, if, on the other hand, you want to examine features of persisters, you need to stack the deck to improve your chances of detecting them. We tried that with our immunodeficient mice, but there are other ways that this might now be uh, improved to study these, uh, these um, organisms. I think that can be done if you use the high-dose inocula of these late-phase cultures. If you use ticks that have been artificially infected by, um, uh, with cultured Borrelia as opposed to allowing them to acquire infection from uh, from the animal itself. If you use large number of ticks to transmit an infection, that was actually used in dog studies years ago, which are listed in Dr. Barthold's uh, last slide uh, by Dr. Straubinger, where he used uh, some, in some time up to 40 adult ticks to transmit an infection. And then lastly, by using animals that have immune deficiencies that may allow for survival of some of these forms. And that, I think, brings me to the host I itself. There are subtle genetic differences that may play a significant role in expression of disease. So recent research has actually ex uncovered an explanation for why the B6 mouse on the left below is um, more resistant uh, to uh, the inflammatory manifestations of infection with Borrelia than the C3H mouse on the right. The C3H mouse um, has a genetic polymorphism, a difference in a single gene that leads to low expression of an enzyme that uh, normally clears inflammatory proteins that are produced normally by our cells during an everyday cell life. And uh, infection uh, results in an increase in the production of this particular group of proteins, which in the absence of appropriate clearance uh, can cause more inflammation independent of the, back, the inflammation that's driven by the bacteria itself. So, in concluding, I think uh, we have to understand that human biology is very complex, and I believe that persistence of Borrelia after antibiotics and other possible explanations for persistence of symptoms after Lyme disease needs to be studied in the human system. I, I think this, uh, for a variety of reasons, our knowledge of factors that influence our health uh, in many ways, and not, in, not just in our genetic makeup, they're influenced by the bacteria that we have in and on our, uh, us. Uh, this is something called our microbiome, how our immune system has been shaped over the course of our lives by our experiences um, with other pathogens and also because of the types of microbes that we harbor within ourselves. And ongoing studies that are funded by the NIH and other groups are gathering information about how natural variations in your genes, 
in immunity and the microbiome among people contributes to disease. And this is disease that's not just infectious disease, but it's things like obesity and, and susceptibility to other uh, uh, problems. These types of, I think, broad research approaches undoubtedly are going to raise uh, new questions we haven't yet considered that may help us explain the sequela of Lyme disease. And I think that by turning to the human system to try to understand uh, this disorder, we'll be learning a lot more. And I'll end there. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bakkenstead. Um, there's a couple questions that come in, and we have time for. Um, the first one is, are there differences in persistence between Bergdorferi strains? You made mention of it in the beginning of your talk. Maybe you could uh, give us some well, thoughts. Uh, you know, what's interesting is that when this has been studied in people, that the strains uh, of Borrelia that can be isolated from people, uh, from the skin and those that you find in the blood um, uh, are, are slightly different. So those, there are many more types of strains that might be isolated from an erythema migrans lesion. Um, and then what you can isolate from other sites uh, in uh, the human body. So those that disseminate are just a subgroup of those that seem to be uh, detected in the erythema migraine lesions, which suggests that there's difference in virulence and infectivity of these uh, strains. And that has actually been reproduced in an animal model. So I think that, uh, yes, there could potentially be dis differences in the ability of certain strains to persist and, and, and uh, others might might be less able to do so. Um, thank you. An another question is, uh, it actually relates to an earlier question, um, but it would be good to have your thoughts about um, how the immune reactive, do you have any thoughts about how the immune reactive material that you did find might possibly be responsible for, you know, obviously the trying to draw a connection between the long term physical disability in people is difficult, but even though the, the immune response, um, can you give your thoughts about that? Well, so I think this is, this is a really important question. So we have to think about, when you think about the human body, they, we have acquired infections during our lives that are still with us. I can give an example. If you had chickenpox as a child, you still have the chickenpox virus in you. And where you have your immune system is working all every time all, all day to control that that virus and keep it from giving you symptoms. If your immune system is suppressed or you you're you're physically stressed or uh, you can actually have recrudescence of infection with the chickenpox virus, and that comes out in the form of shingles. So that's an example of a persistent infection that you're not paying much attention to, but your immune system is. So in terms of these particular um, remnants that we're finding, certainly they may be eliciting some kind of response from the host. Whether the person feels that response is, is unclear. Uh, and I don't think it's, it's going to be very difficult to figure that out in a, in a human system. We can detect in an animal system as uh, uh, immune responses to these that may be ongoing in the tissues because the immune system may be trying to clear this. But whether that's also translating into symptoms people have is something that is, it needs to be explored. And I think, again, looking at how people's immune responses are, are different from, uh, in somebody who's cleared the infection or is, is feeling well, I should say, after antibiotics, versus somebody who's not feeling well after antibiotics might help us understand why, uh, why they're feeling the way they are. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. There's one of the listeners asked, they, they didn't understand why the method of inoculation might matter if the bacteria are growing inside the host anyway. Well, uh, in, when you uh, use a cultured inoculum, you can introduce uh, a variety, a, a, a wider variety of, of organisms that may, the immune system may came, care more or less about. And so the ones that are slower growing may be ignored some extent compared to the ones that are faster growing and maybe more raising more red flags to the immune system. That's one possibility uh, to explain those results. So I think that when we, if we, we want to study that in detail, we have to kind of stack the decks, as I mentioned, to see if you really put in many of these organisms that are so-called persisters, would you actually have greater expansion of those, and what would the immune system do then in that situation? Thanks. 
Actually, we had time for one more, and I think it's a good question for you because of your imaging uh, data, and that is, um, do you observe different morphological forms of Borrelia in your studies, and how might these different forms affect the immune response, um, potentially therapy, and persistence? I don't see different morphological forms. The organisms we see are kind of usual uh, spirochetes. Depending upon the orientation, you, they may more, look more uh, linear, or and some may be wavier. Uh, but the, the forms themselves are the same. We have seen them, and this was published in our paper, that when we watch over time, we have seen a spirochete dive into uh, traveling through tissue and then suddenly abruptly stop, and it seems to ball up into a ball and then poof, disappears. And that, the kinetics of that um, a reaction is something that is the kinetics of how a phagocyte or immune cell can take up a, a, an organism and how it pulls in the organism and degrades the organism. So in that setting, in, in our mice, we haven't been able to, um, uh, we haven't labeled the, the immune cells to show that if we see that phenomenon, which is occasionally we can capture that, whether that's actually a spirochete that's being engulfed by a, a, an immune cell. Um, I think those are something, I, we have not seen anything that might be resembling a cyst form that's sitting in tissues forever. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and for answering all those questions. So at this point, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Monica Embers from Tulane University, who's going to tell us about studies of Borrelia burgdorferi persistence in the non-human primate. Monica? Thank you, Joe. Uh, today I'll be talking specifically about the non-human primate model of Lyme disease and studies of persistence. First of all, um, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome can it be explained by a number of different in a number of different ways. Um, potential causes of post-treatment Lyme disease include the induction of inflammatory responses by lingering dead spirochetes or remnants that uh, Dr. Wachenstedt just talked about. It can also be caused by the continuation of active spirochetal infection or as an autoimmune response, and this would constitute irreversible sequelae from previous active infection. Most likely, it's a combination of these three and can vary from patient to patient. There are a couple of considerations when it comes to antibiotic treatment. Doxycycline is by far the most prescribed antibiotic for Lyme disease. And doxycycline is a microbiostatic antibiotic. What that means is that the antibiotic actually acts on actively dividing cells and it slows the growth of the bacteria. So efficacy essentially relies on the immune clearance of the static bacteria. Borrelia burgdorferi evades the immune response, as we know, in many different ways. So we have to question how effective the immune response actually is. We also have evidence that dormant bacteria or slow-growing bacteria are more tolerant of microbiostatic antibiotics. In addition, Borrelia burgdorferi survives for many months inside ticks without nutrient replenishment or replication. So dormancy is actually a part of their phenotypic repertoire. And finally, Borrelia burgdorferi can be found in deep connective tissues and in joints. So we have to think about what the tissue penetration of the antibiotic is. I'm not aware of studies measuring antibiotic levels in tissues versus blood. So in, in terms of the rhesus macaque model of Lyme disease, we know that rhesus macaques very closely mimic the multi-organ character of human Lyme disease. This includes disease hallmarks such as erythema migrans, carditis, arthritis, and neuropathy of the central and peripheral nervous systems. The spirochete burden also in tissues following dissemination is likely very small, as it would be in humans. This is a low-level infection, and it's difficult to culture the spirochetes from humans or monkeys, whether they've been treated or not, after a disseminated infection. Some advantages of this model 
are that compared to mice, the disease course, including the duration and quantity of Borrelia in the blood and the immune response, is more similar to that of humans. Also in comparison to human samples, the infection history of a, a rhesus macaque can be known. We know the exact point of infection, the exposure duration, and the previous exposure history. Also, tissues can be examined post-necropsy for the presence of Borrelia, which cannot be done in humans. Post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome is primarily comprised of objective symptoms that can only be conveyed by humans and not by animals. <laughs> for example, we cannot ask our monkeys if they have persistent fatigue or myalgia. However, we can inspect potentially infected tissues, such as muscles, joints, and nervous system, to uncover signs of inflammation. This could be inferred to contribute to post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome if we find the presence of Borrelia in those tissues. In 2012, we published a paper on persistence of Borrelia in rhesus macaques. Here we show that intact spirochetes recovered by xenodiagnosis from treated monkeys. We also showed that Borrelia RNA was detected in tissues of infected animals, whether they were treated or not. This showed that spirochetes could persist post-treatment in a representative animal model. <clears throat> this left some caveats and open questions. First, there, at the time that we did the study, there was a lack of pharmacokinetic data in rhesus macaques for doxycycline. We have since performed these studies and found that the level of antibiotic that we use for our studies was far, ex far exceeded that recommended for humans. Also, as Dr. Bakenstedt mentioned, we did not use tick-mediated infection. So the question becomes whether or not the initial inoculum can affect treatment efficacy months later. Important questions that resulted from these studies are what, what is the phenotype of persistent spirochetes and are they viable? Are they attenuated or perhaps in a state of dormancy? Also, can spirochetes persist long-term or they eventually just cleared from the host. <clears throat> so we designed the following study to repeat our previous study, but this time using tick-mediated infection. So we've essentially repeated the experiment. We start with infection of the animals, 10 animals with um, an infl tick. And at four months post-infection, five animals were treated with a 28-day regimen of doxy, and five animals were untreated. Three months after antibiotic treatment, the animals were subjected to xenodiagnosis. Also, at five months post-infection, the animals were again treated, or again subjected to xenodiagnosis, and then necropsy was performed. So if we look at the antibody responses of five of these 10 animals, we see different patterns. I'd like to um, draw your attention to C6 here, which is one of the antigens. Each figure represents one antigen. Each line represents one animal. And this is the antibody titer over time for the course of the infection for that animal. If you look at C6, you can see that the dark blue and red lines correspond to two animals that were treated. At 28 um, weeks of infection, you can see that the antibiotic titer, or that the C6 titer declined significantly following antibiotic treatment for those that were treated, and the levels remain elevated for those animals that were untreated. One animal shown in purple, which is actually an untreated animal, did not have a C6 response at all. So there was some variation. But we know that our animals were productively infected. Shown here is the tick mediated infection in panel A. In panel B, show, we show one animal out of 10 that developed a bona fide erythema migrans lesion. 
other animals exhibited some diffuse erythema. They also showed that culture of skin biopsy tissue resulted in positive detection for five of 10 monkeys and detection by DNA PCR was positive for eight of 10 monkeys. When we looked at the pathology, we found small pockets of inflammation in various tissues, whether the animals were treated or untreated. For example, shown here is perineural inflammation of the right ulnar nerve. We also saw axillary node um, hyperplasia. In, we saw hyperplasia in the lungs of two animals. In a treated animal, we also saw cervical spinal nerve inflammation and focal inflammation in the skeletal muscle. Now, this may or may not be related to infection. So next, we need to look for Borrelia in these sites to determine if um, Borrelia plays a role in the induction of inflammation. In terms of the xenodiagnostic tick results, we found that few of our ticks were positive. Um, so we noticed that after second feeding of ticks, we found these erythematous papules at the site of the tick bite. And this indicated to us that anti-tick immunity could be playing a role. This was confirmed by histology. In panel B, you see the normal skin tissue, and in panel C, you see inflammation at the site of the tick bite. We knew from previous studies that, that um, anti-tick immunity would not affect transmission, but we know now that perhaps it could affect xenodiagnosis because these are very different processes. In conclusion, in order to examine the infectivity of persistent spirochetes, we designed the following experiment. We took six naive rhesus macaques, infected them by needle inoculation, and at four months of infection, treated half of them with doxycycline for 28 days and left three untreated. Those monkeys were then fed upon by naive ticks, and the tick contents were pooled from each group of animals and inoculated into naive monkeys and into, into severe combined immune deficient mice. After the injection of tick contents, the monkeys and mice were subjected to xenodiagnosis, um, various skin biopsy, um, tissue biopsies, and serology, and eventually necropsy. Currently, the experimental protocol is complete, and we're looking inside ticks and recipient animal tissues for Borrelia burgdorferi. And with that, I'd like to thank the members of my lab and of uh, the Primate Center in general for my funding. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Embers. Um, we have time for just a few questions. Uh, the first one is uh, from a listener who wants to better understand how DNA diagnosis works. How does uh, free Borrelia DNA get attracted to the tick in the first place? That's a very good question. Um, there. Are one possibility is that we're not using the right um, reagents to try to detect the spirochetes and the ticks. They may be of these different forms, and we're not seeing them as spirochetes. Um, but I find it difficult to explain how DNA could migrate without a spirochete to a feeding tick. Related to that is how does this finding DNA itself indicate viable Borrelia, or does it mean something else? This relate, actually, that question relates to many speakers, but you're up. I would, say, I would <laughs> say that DNA itself does not indicate a live parakeet. Um, more valuable would be RNA or um, an intact organism. So. I think you need to, to use multiple methods in order to determine if those spirochetes exist and if they're in a, a metabolic, metabolically active um, state. Okay. And I think the last question for this section, um, 
someone asked about uh, co-infections, which it doesn't sound like you looked at other, but have you done this with other bacteria? We have not looked at co-infections. Um, but that's something very important to consider when we think about uh, the proportion of people who um, generate rashes at the site of the tick bite, um, previous exposure or co-infection, um, those sorts of things could contribute to whether or not uh, patients develop rashes or anti-tick immunity, which is moderate in humans. Um, one more question, sorry. Um, one listener asked, only one monkey developed bullseye, although all the same strain was used and they were all uh, theoretically treated the same. Can you explain? Sure. Um, we did use the exact same strain, which is not indicative of what would happen in humans. Um, also, monkeys are not humans, so it's difficult to infer that just because only one of 10 monkeys develops an EM rash, that only 10% of humans develop an EM rash. Um, the only way to determine truly how, what proportion of humans develop a rash would be to take a mixture of different isolates in the, in, in the environment and let them feed on 100 people and see how many actually develop a rash. So I think for our studies, it's related to the, the, the animal species and the Borrelia species, and I, I, I hesitate to, to infer those results to, to the human disease. Okay, fine. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Embers. Um, and I'd like to move now to Dr. Adrian Marquez, uh, who's actually here at NIAID. Um, for she's going to discuss searching for persistence of infection in Lyme disease. Dr. Marquez. Thank you, Joe. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Adriana Marquez. I work at NAID, part of the National Institute of Health. I'm a physician. My work is in clinical research in Lyme disease. And I'll be talking today about our study using chicks as a magical device for the diagnosis of Lyme disease in humans. So as already has been discussed, the pathogenesis of post-Lyme disease symptoms is an area of great controversy. And it's likely that different factors will play a role in an individual case. For example, in one patient, it may be just the natural resolution of the disease, while in another patient, it may be due to another condition that develops after Lyme disease. There have been four placebo controlled antibiotic treatment trials for post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. These trials have shown that, in general, retreatment provides little, if any, benefit and carries significant risk. But one of the questions that physicians face is whether a pers persistent infection could be the cause of the symptoms in a particular patient. This can be challenging, mainly because there is no simple test that can easily differentiate patients who may still have the infection and could potentially benefit from further treatment. The available antibody-based assays cannot be used to determine successful eradication of the organism. And current direct tests for the presence of Bibrodorphora, which are culture and PCR, have low sensitivity outside the skin and blood samples from untreated patients with early Lyme disease, mostly erythema margins, or PCR in synovial fluid of patients with Lyme arthritis. As has been discussed, animal studies have, been, have shown that spirochetes, or their DNA, may persist after therapy in dogs, mice, and monkeys, and could be acquired by xenodiagnosis. So xenodiagnosis could provide researchers with a new tool with which to study the mechanism of disease in humans. I want to point out that ticks are not simply crawling needles and syringes. Tick saliva has been shown to be a chemoattractant for the organism, and feeding ticks have the potential to aggregate and concentrate bacteria from a wide area, improving sensitivity. Now, nothing was known about the parameters of the diagnosis of Lyme disease in humans. So we set up a phase one study to develop the technique and to assess the safety of the procedure. The results of this phase one study are now published in the journal Clinical Infectious Diseases. This is the first human study to, 
of the use of xenodiagnosis to detect Bibordorfer infection. What is not in the publication is a description of the enormous amount of work that went into actually doing this study. This was a collaborative study, and participants were enrolled at three sites. The study was approved by the IRB at each center, and written informed consent was obtained from all participants. The chicks are considered a diagnostic device, and the study was conducted under ID, an investigational device exemption, approved by the FDA, and an independent, independent medical monitor review interim data for safety. These were the study groups. One group will include the patients with erythema migrans one to four months post-antibiotic therapy. The aim of including this group was to reduce the early treatment group in the mice studies. Other groups included patients with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome and patients with persistently high levels of C6 antibodies after antibiotic therapy. One of the difficulties was who would be the positive control group. Why the best control group would be patients with erythema migrans who were untreated. We thought that that would be too risky to not treat these patients for the time needed for the chicks to complete the feeding due to the possibility of dissemination. So we decided to have patients with erythema migrans who are just starting antibiotic therapy as possible positive controls. And I say possible because it's known that culture and PCR of skin biopsies becomes negative very quickly after starting antibiotics. We also planned another possible positive control group, which were patients with Lyme arthritis who had not been treated. These patients have had infections for months, and a few days without antibiotic therapy would not influence disease. Unfortunately, we are not able to, accrue, to enroll in this group during this study because patients who came to us already had started antibiotic therapy or had received steroids. Then for negative controls, we enrolled healthy volunteers who had no history of Lyme disease and were seronegative. Here is how the xenodiagnostic chicks were prepared. These were pathogen-free exodus capillaries larval chicks that come from a laboratory-maintained colony at St. Alfred's Laboratory at the School of Veterinary Medicine. One-third of the larval chicks from each batch was tested for Bibordorfera, Babesia, Anaplasma, Borrelia miyamotoi, Bartonella, Rickettsia, Deer chick virus, and Orbivirus by PCR. And skid mice were infested with subsets of larvae from each batch and monitored for one month of illness. Also, a subset of the chicks was also tested by the PCR electrospray ionization mass spectroscopy at IBIS for Francisella, Babesia, Borrelia, Spirochetes, Rickettsia, and alpha proteobacteria. This is how the chick placement procedure was done. Uh, at the first day, about 25 to 30 larval chicks were placed under retention dressing. If possible, the area of placement was close to an area where disease was observed, like the erythema migdon site or close to an affected joint. Participants then returned to the clinic for chick removal starting at day three or four, and at the day when all the chicks were removed, a skin punch biopsy was performed at a feeding site. Participants were then followed at seven to 10 days, four to six weeks, and three months after chick removal. They kept a, day, a, day, a card of symptoms for the first month. Now remember, there was no previous protocol for xenon diagnosis with fixoid scapular larvae in humans. So it took us a lot of work, but thanks to the amazing work of the research nurses, we developed a retention dressing using the left flat dressing, which is used for magoid therapy of wounds. We modified this dressing by adding a foreign ring to create a barrier between the chicks and the adhesive. With this dressing, we were able to get between 30 to 50% of chicks to feed successfully. A very important part of the study was, of course, how we are going to test the chicks for acquisition of infection. Our initial protocol followed the animal studies. The live-fed chicks were allowed to molt to nymphs, and the nymphs were placed on skid mice and allowed to feed. After feeding, the nymphs were then tested by culture in PCR, and the skid mice was checked at two weeks by culture in PCR of a ear punch biopsy 
and at four weeks by culture of PCR of skin, ankle joint, heart, and bladder tissues. Now, a few months after we had the placement procedure working, we reviewed the results, and we saw that they were losing too many chicks during molting and recovering of the nymphs after feeding on skid mice. Because we could not afford to lose even one in the diagnostic chick, we changed the way the chicks were handled. The protocol was amended to remove the steps and perform direct analysis of the fed larva. So in protocol two, chicks were crushed and tested directly by culture and PCR and injection of lysates into skid mice with subsequent culture and PCR. We also started a collaboration with IBIS, and a portion of the chicks were tested directly by using the RSA. These assays use eight PCR primer pairs that target seven Borrelia genes and can be used to distinguish genotypic variation. An important point is that larval chicks are very, very small, and each chick was tested individually and was tested by only one method. Here are the characteristics of the participants in the study. We had 36 individuals who underwent xenodiagnosis, 21 men and 15 women with a median age of 55 years. Seven patients underwent more than one procedure. Participants including 10 patients with high C6 antibody levels, 10 patients with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, five patients after, with erythema migrans after they received the antibiotic therapy, and one patient with erythema migrans early in, in treatment, our positive control, and 10 healthy volunteers. About the high C6 groups, these participants enrolled at a median of 4.5 years after the original diagnosis and had received a median of 2.5 course of antibiotics. The most common presenting manifestation was Lyme arthritis. In the post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome group, these patients enrolled at a median of 3.8 years after the original diagnosis and they had received a median of two courses of antibiotics. The most common, common initial presenting presenting manifestation of Lyme disease was erythema migrans. And uh, the most common symptoms of at enrollment were fatigue, difficulty concentrating, memory complaints, and arthralgias. Here are the results of our study. We learned that xenodiagnosis was well tolerated. All participants successfully completed the chick placement, and there were no withdrawals during the study. The most common adverse event was mild itching at the site, which was seen in 58% of the participants, with a median duration of three days. There were no serious adverse events associated with the procedures, and larval chicks require four to five days to feed to repletion. Of the 23 participants with Lyme disease uh, who had at least one chick tested, either by protocol one or two, 19 were negative. Two were indeterminate because we could not rule out laboratory contamination. The chicks from all the healthy volunteers were negatives, and all tissues from the skid mice tested negative by PCR and culture. All skin biopsies were negative by culture and culture PCR, and six biopsies were tested directly by the IBIS assays were negative. We had two participants that we considered they had positives in the diagnostic results. One was our positive control, the patient with erythema migrans who had start therapy with doxycycline at the same time that the chicks were placed. This participant was completing the fourth day of antibiotic therapy when the chicks were collected. Chicks from this individual tested positive by the IBIS assay on two separate specimens, one from a single chick and one from a pool of three chicks. A single chick was positive for two Bibordorfer genotypes. Six other chicks from this participant tested negative by culture and PCR. The skin biopsy was negative. This individual repeated the xenodiagnostic procedure seven months after completing the antibiotic therapy, and 10 chicks were tested using the IBIS assay and were negative. One patient with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome was considered positive in two separate xenodiagnostic procedures performed eight months apart. From the first xenodiagnostic procedure, one nymph was found to be positive by PCR of the nymph lysate culture. The positive PCR 
of these cultures confirmed by additional PCRs, and the DNA extracted was then tested by IBIS and identified it as from a novel genotype of puber porphyra. Four other nymphs were negative in all testing, and all tissues from the skid mice on which the nymphs were fed were negative. The Zeno diagnosis was then repeated eight months later. At that time, only two fed ticks were recovered. Direct testing by IBIS revealed that one tick was positive for Bibordorphia, and the results were consistent with the previously found genotype. The other tick was tested by PCR and culture and was negative. So in summary, we have developed a protocol for xenodiagnosis with sod scapularis larva in humans that swell tolerate. Adverse events were minimal, limited predominantly to itching at the tick bite sites. We have shown that up to 30 larval ticks can be applied, and 30 to 50 percent of the ticks feed successfully. We also shown that larval ticks required four to five days to feed to repletion in humans. Our initial results shown that the majority of the patients with Lyme disease treated with antibiotic therapy are negative by Zeno diagnosis. Caveats include that, in general, we tested only a small number of ticks per participant, particularly early in the study. And in animal studies, the number of fed ticks tested were important for sensitivity of Zeno diagnosis. The more ticks tested, the higher the power. Another important point is that we found DNA only. What is not sufficient evidence regarding the presence of viable spirochetes, and that we don't have, there is no gold standard for comparison of these results. So what is in the future? We think Zeno diagnosis may be used as a tool to develop better tools and to test hypotheses and new strategies for therapy. And we hope we'll perform maybe to do studies to identify whether persistence of the bacteria or bacterial products as shown by xenodiagnosis, can be used to predict persistence of symptoms. And here's the most important slide with the people that made this study possible. They include the study teams at NIH, Tufts, Yale, and Mansfield Clinic, as well as the collaborator at IBIS. Also, I want to thank Fred Gill and Jude Starling at the NIH Clinical Center and the staff of RCHSPB at NAID who helped with this study, and principally thank the study participants for their enthusiastic involvement with the study. And I stop here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Martez. Um, to keep time, I'm gonna, I have one question that came in. And it says, how did you determine that the two instances of laboratory contamination and establish that your other results arose from DNA within the tick and not from contamination? Well, for, uh, we could not rule out con uh, laboratory contamination on that two, uh, study, uh, two results. Therefore, we didn't, we've put them as inconclusive. The positive results, uh, we... Uh, well, on the post-treatment uh, Lyme patient, we have shown we shown that there was a novel genotype of Borrelia that was not didn't have any in the lab that would match that strain. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more uh, brief question, if I could. Um, isn't finding a positive Borrelia in one system indicative that persistent bacteria is a possible hypothesis? Can you repeat the question, though? I couldn't hear you well. Sorry. Isn't finding a positive uh, Borrelia in one participant indicative that persistent bacteria is a possible hypothesis? That came in from a listener. I think it's a possible hypothesis, but we did not prove that this, that we found Borrelia. We found DNA from Borrelia, so that goes back to the discussion that right. the other speakers we have been discussing about uh, viability and how okay. to how to prove. Perfect. Thank you. There are a couple of the questions, but I think we better move to our next participant, and then if there's time, we can revisit um, since. The next two are related. Uh, the next speaker in yours. Uh.
are, are highly related. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Marquez. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lyndon Hugh from Tufts, who is going to talk uh, about the consensus and controversy of Borrelia burgdorferi persistence. Dr. Dr. Hugh? Thank you, Joe. Um, so when uh, Joe and Ben asked me to um, talk about, to kind of sum up the, the different studies and uh, talk about consensus and controversy, I actually thought the consensus part was going to be a really short part of this talk. Um, but actually, when I went back over the studies, if you ignore the, you know, the discussions for the studies and the editorials that were written, if you look at the actual data, you know, there, there are some, a lot of the findings are very, very consistent um, across different laboratories, across the antibiotic regimens and the delivery systems and the host. And, you know, although a lot of time has been spent today talking about the differences between the studies, I actually think that, you know, the fact that, we're, that so many different people are seeing the same results in different systems um, really speaks to the robustness of the finding. You know, when I hear findings that are, you know, only replicable by one lab, in, you know, certain media when the wind is blowing from the northwest at 10 miles an hour, you know, I think artifact. And when I see things that are robust like this, you know, you feel much more confident in the, in the, um, the results. So what are the things that I think almost all of the studies have seen? And one is that, you know, antibiotics greatly decrease the number of bacteria or the amount of DNA in, in treated animals, and I think everybody would agree with that. Um, Many of the studies, I think most of the studies, looked at the C6 antibody titers, and everybody saw a decrease after antibiotic therapy. And I think that just speaks to the, the fact that the numbers of bacteria are going down. More interestingly, I think all of the studies, at least in a some proportion of their animals, have seen DNA and or, and or RNA persist. And it can be detected either by xenodiagnosis or by DNA or RNA amplification techniques. Um, m multiple studies have also seen that the protein antigens persist and can be detected by any number of different immunofluorescent techniques. And the last thing that I think that, you know, holds true across all these studies is nobody has been able to culture these bacteria after antibiotic therapy. So where, where have the most controversial aspects been about um, all these studies? Um, and I think one thing that has gotten hit on um, in multiple editorials is that the antibiotic regimens have differed and there have been questions raised about the appropriateness of the doses that are used in the different animals. The other part that, you know, I think is confusing and goes back to the non-cultivatability of these bacteria is that transmission from a Z-dog diagnostic tick to an uninfected animal or transplantation of tissue from one animal to the other has only been seen by one group. And this would be additional evidence that, you know, the bacteria are alive and the, the particles are, are movable. All right. So uh, I think, you know, what are the implications for human Lyme disease? Oops. And I think I skipped the slide here. All right. <clears throat> so, um, and I think this has been mentioned by multiple speakers, and, and that is that, you know, there is unfortunately no good animal model for post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And therefore, you know, it's very tough to take any of these studies and link the, the persistence of whatever it is we want to call it, bacteria, DNA, RNA, proteins, to symptoms of post-treatment Lyme disease. And I say yes here because, you know, obviously if you know that there is something foreign that's detectable there, it's a legitimate question to raise whether it's related to these symptoms. Um, but unfortunately, the animal studies that we have now, while they're very interesting, can't answer this question directly. So let's take on, you know, uh, so Let's take on some of these issues that have been raised with these, the animal studies, because I think they're still instructive and they still have potential to inform our future human studies. So what about the issues of antibiotic dosing? Um, and here, um, you know, Monica addressed it a little bit, and I think Steve addressed it and Linda addressed it, um, about whether um, the doses of antibiotics um, in the animals mimic that that's actually seen for these antibiotics when they're used in humans. And I guess I I'm going to say take the – Tact that I think, you know, in some sense in my mind that matters less. Um, because if you're talking about clearance being related to a very narrow therapeutic window of antibiotics, I think then you would have to say that there's going to be the likelihood that many, many humans would have persistence of the, these bacteria. Because um, as a physician, I can tell you that most, of, most people can't take the antibiotics as prescribed, and that includes me when I get sick. You know, I can't take my antibiotics three times a day on an every eight-hour schedule. 
And we as physicians also, for many of these antibiotics, don't dose adjust. So we give the exact same dosage to a 350-pound person as we would to a 99-pound person. And I can tell you that the pharmacokinetics are likely to be very, very different. And then you have all the other genetic and renal and um, metabolism things that are different from person to person. So if you have to be in a very narrow range to, to manifest clearance of these organisms or success of these antibiotics, then I think we're in trouble. But I, I, I'm going to put that issue aside and deal with kind of the more interesting issue, I think, which is what about this inability to culture after antibiotic therapy? Oops, sorry, uh, I've lost it. All right, there you go. Um, so there are um, a number of different possible explanations, and these aren't all of them. These are um, the ones I think that have been most discussed. And, you know, in some sense, they're all unlikely, and they all break established rules, but, you know, something's got to be true. So, you know, initially when the stories of uh, reports of persistence were coming out, you know, the first concern, because um, most of the detection was done by um, PCR amplification or other um, non-culture techniques, was whether this could be laboratory contamination. And I think as more and more laboratories um, have been finding the same um, results, I think that becomes much less of an, uh, a likelihood. Um, the other two main hypotheses, um, one is that um, the DNA, RNA, or proteins from bacteria can persist for many months after the organisms are dead or um, that the bacteria persist but are somehow altered by antibiotic exposure to no longer be cultivatable. <laughs> and let's take a look at these, what data we might have to support either of these uh, hypotheses. And I'll, I'll tell you right up front that, you know, both of them, there's not that much to support either of them. So um, if you want to look at data to support persistence of bacterial products without bacteria, um, when you look at DNA from killed bacteria that are injected into mice, it could pretty quickly uh, becomes undetectable. And I, I think those were studies that were done by Mark Wooten's lab. Um, if you look similarly about DNA or RNA from other sources, like CPG DNA or uh, fetal DNA, which you can detect in the mother up until birth, and then it's very rapidly cleared within hours um, from the maternal blood. So other sources of foreign DNA and RNA get cleared very, very quickly. Um, and then if you look at there are multiple studies of foreign proteins, fluorescent proteins uh, from different sources that have been injected into animals or humans, and the clearance is very, very quick. So what about survival of non-cultivatable bacteria? Um, what evidence is there for that? Um, so you've heard a couple of, from a couple of the different presenters about persisters. And um, just to go through the, what persisters are, Persisters are actually seen in many different types of bacterial strains after antibiotic treatment. Persisters um, are defined as phenotypic variants that form during normal bacterial growth that are not, so there's no genetic alteration in these bacteria. And theoretically, they can return to the same state as all the other wild-type bacteria. Um, what's been found is that there are likely to be multiple pathways um, to forming these persister cells, but many of them revolve around slowed cell division. And persisters um, are thought to possibly be a reservoir for reactivation um, in other bacteria and are usually cultivatable um, after removal of the antibiotics. So that's something that's different than what we see, what we're seeing here with the Borrelia story. And persistence um, in these other bacteria often occur in the absence of symptoms. So you can find them in patients who are treated for these particular bacteria and completely healthy. So it's unclear whether they might uh, uh, be related to persistence of symptoms at all. So really, there's not really a good explanation for why Borrelia would become, become non-cultivatable after antibiotics. Um, some studies have suggested that plasmid loss uh, might be a reason for non-cultivatability. Borrelia lose plasmids very quickly when grown in culture. But um, when you look at the studies, the reliability of detection of plasmids in the settings of very, very low numbers of um, bacteria and bacterial DNA is unclear, and the results have been pretty inconsistent in terms of which plasmids get lost. Um, <clears throat> such that I don't think you can make a coherent story out of it. There has been some evidence for antibiotic selection of non-replicating bacterial persisters in other bacteria. For example, there was a recent paper about salmonella in science. However, even there, those eventually resume growth. And if you think about it, if the, mechan if the reason for having persisters is to um, protect the bacteria against um, clearance from you know, naturally occurring antibiotics, in that sense, the bacteria would have to regrow at some point for this to be a useful mechanism. So um, these are slides. This is a slide I added at the last second um, based on information that Steve Barthol gave me. So I'm going to 
kick any questions about this over to Steve. Um, but Steve pointed out that there's actually a literature in Coxiella Bernetti where uh, it's, it's a similar story to Borrelia where there, there, it's a long-term disease um, that requires long-term antibiotic therapy to cure. There is a post coxiella fatigue syndrome in a subset of patients, and there have been studies where there's long-term persistence of antigens and or DNA without cultivatable bacteria. And, in fact, there was one study that showed that patients 12 years after treatment, when they took samples from patients 12 years after treatment and injected them into mice, um, it resulted in detectable antigens recovered from the spleens of these mice, but negative cultures and negative PCR. Um, and the authors of that paper described it as a potential antigenic immunomodulatory complex. So, you know, I don't know what to make of these studies. It's interesting, and it may be that um, rather than Borrelia breaking the rules, it's that there are rules that we don't understand about how these bacteria persist and what it actually causes. So, um, in summary, um, what do we need to do next, and where do we go from here? Well, I think one thing is that we certainly need a better understanding of what happens um, to these Borrelia proteins um, from killed organisms. So, to better understand uh, Linda's data, um, as to whether you can see long-term persistence of antigens and, um, <clears throat> and proteins um, after injection of um, these proteins. Um, we also could use new strategies for trying to cultivate bacteria after antibiotic therapy. Um, you know, if they stop growing, why do they stop growing if they're alive? Do they need a, are they waiting for a signal to regrow? Or are they really dead and we're just, you know, trying to jumpstart the dead? Um, we also need better tests for detecting presence of small amounts of Borrelia products, Borrelia or their products in humans. Um, you know, Adriana talked about the use of xenodiagnosis, and xenodiagnosis is, um, I think, an important tool for um, detecting Borrelia, but it's obviously not something that can be done on a wide scale. And if we could find something that works better, that's able to detect it, then we'd have a tool for really um, determining if um, there's any correlation between the presence of these um, products and the persistence of symptoms. And then finally, sorry, I'm having computer problems. Um, you know, really, I think what everybody is getting at is that the only way to get at whether um, any of these really interesting findings have meaning for persistent symptoms in patients with post-treatment Lyme disease is to really do the human studies and to try and um, determine whether we can find a test that can be used to predict persistence of symptoms. And with that, I'll stop. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hu. Um, we have just a few very short minutes left, um, but I, I, there's one short question that came in. It's for Dr. Marquez. Will you be continuing your xenodiagnosis study? Hello. Um, yeah. We we hope we can. At this point, we are trying to um, finding ways to continue our studies. If it was Linda has mentioned we think it can be an important tool to develop new tools that might be easier to use, uh, and uh, we hope we'll be able to perform studies that will correlate. Um, they will try to, to see the prevalence of symptoms uh, in the, the xenodiagnosed results. Great. Thank you. I just want to remind the listeners uh, and the participants that the, this presentation that will be transcribed and archived with the presentations included, and it will be available um, both the CDC website and the NIID website after um, the transcription occurs. So there is a delay, but it will be available uh, at a later time and will be publicly available for anyone who wasn't able to uh, participate here today. Um, and and if there's a, a minute or so left. Um, I believe uh, Dr. Bakkenset had a uh, comment about the DNA and ticks. Uh, yes, thank you, Joe. I wanted to answer the question about how does DNA get into ticks and if, if it's free DNA. And I think there's a presumption that it's free. This DNA may, may be sequestered in other cell types that might be long-lived resident cells in your skin. They're, for example, the ticks, when they take up a blood meal, are taking up um, anything that's coming into their environment that's attracted by the, by the ticks feeding. That will include 
um, cells such as macrophages in the skin that may harbor something that is Borrelia related. We don't know how long Borrelia might be retained in certain subtypes of macrophages. This is something that's a, a new area of exploration for people just in general is, is how different subtypes of macrophages respond to different stimuli. And so I think that, that, that it, the presumption is that it's free, but I don't necessarily think it's free. It could be traveling in a, in a mammalian cell. It could be traveling in a Borrelia cell. And I, I think that's a, a, an important question to, to answer. Okay. Thank you. I, actually, we're out of time, and I want to thank the, all the participants and the listeners for calling in and for answering questions. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Beard, uh, as well, for organizing on the CDC end. And uh, at that, I think we'll have to close. Thank you all. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.